Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CRWP's speaker series. Um, today, we are joined by ODNR's two of the finest, um, Kate Parsons and John Navarro. Uh, Kate is the Wildlife Diversity Program Administrator, and John is the Aquatic Stewardship Program Administrator. Um, and today they're going to talk to us about some of the stuff they've been working on and the wildlife here in Ohio. Um, all the participants are muted, but you can use the um, chat feature to type a question. And at the end of the um, at the end of the webinar, I can go through and read the questions off, and um, so you can get your answers that way. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, we are recording this. Um, so you can always go back and watch it. We'll post it on our YouTube and social media. Um, and I think with that, I will hand it over to Kate and let you guys get started. All right, Eric, thank you so much for inviting John and I here today. Hopefully I am sharing my screen and you can see our first slide. If not, please let me know. Um, yep. So good morning, everyone. We are here today to talk about Ohio um, endangered and threatened species and give you a quick update on several of the important uh, wildlife and fish in our state. Starting off a little with a little bit of background is our endangered species law. It's a part of the Ohio Revised Code and it restricts the taking or also known as killing of native wildlife that are threatened with being extirpated from our state. It does allow take for certain purposes to preserve the species, it's usually education or science. There is a penalty for violating the law, which can include a fine, jail time, and a civil penalty, basically a, a cost per animal that is harmed. And there is quite a bit of difference between the state law and the federal law, which is important to note. So the federal law has many different components as far as there's incidental take, which means take that wasn't intended. Um, there's protection of habitat, and take doesn't just mean killing, it can also mean harming an animal, which is part of the reason that you see um, a lot more discussion about the federal law in the news. An important component of our law is in the administrative code, which is essentially how the revised code is enacted, and it includes a list of endangered species. Our first list was in 1974, this list is formally reviewed every five years, and um, this year was uh, one of our review years, so we'll have updates in 2022. So we have six different categories for our endangered species law. Extinct means that it's disappeared from its entire range. Extirpated means it's disappeared from our state. Endangered means that it's threatened with extirpation. Threatened means it's becoming endangered. So as you can see, all of these are relatively hierarchical. And species of concern, meaning it um, may become threatened or we have insufficient information. And the last is special interest, <clears throat> excuse me, which we use for sometimes for species that are returning to our state after they've been extirpated. And it's unlikely that any management efforts we would undertake would increase their populations, but there are still um, a species we wanna pay attention to. So how do we know, how do we, how do we track this information? There are many different ways. Um, one is pretty straightforward, research and monitoring. There are many entities within our state that contribute to that, state and federal agencies, the Division of Wildlife, universities, metro parks, uh, natural history museums, and other nonprofits. We also have um, statewide monitoring programs. These tend to be somewhat cyclical, happening every five, 10, 20 years, and um, rely quite a bit on volunteer citizens to help collect this information. Here are just a few examples of some that have been done in, in the, our recent history. We also rely quite a bit on public observations and we have an online sighting reporting system, but then there are other sighting reporting systems that you all are probably familiar with like eBird and iNaturalist. So we rely on these sightings to track some species as well. <clears throat> Harvest is definitely another way where we track populations where we're monitoring 
how many animals are harvested, how many animals we have banded, and how many are returning, making sure we know that their population is at a stable level. So this happened in 2021. We submitted a, a listing proposal a request to experts within our state to share updates of status of species. And we go through a very formal process where we basically collect evidence for um, better understanding the status and what, whether or not we need to, to change that status for a species. So that's what John and I have been doing this past year. This is the list as of 2016, will be updated next year. And as you can see, it's a very diverse, everything from mammals to many different kinds of invertebrates and more than 100 species are listed as endangered in Ohio. So we use this list as a tool to prioritize where we put the division resources, where we spend our staff time, where we spend our funding. We also use this list as a focus for environmental review. Environmental review is essentially the division's um, piece of looking at development projects and trying to ensure that there are no impacts to endangered species. And we give advice on how to avoid or minimize impacts that someone may have to endangered species. We also add some procedures for wildlife rehabilitation because there are some, some of those species are pretty rare. So we would like to have input on how they're rehabilitated if they are injured. So I'm the the terrestrial side is my responsibility, and then we will switch it over to John a little bit later in the presentation, and he'll give you an update on aquatic species. Starting out with mammals, um, the gray, spot, gray fox is considered a species of concern. Um, it, as you can see from this graph, it has undergone a decline. We're not fully aware of the causes of decline, um, so it's something that we have been investigating in recent years. Um, the bobcat was removed from the list in 2014 and is still doing very well. We're tracking that primarily through public sightings and also through some research projects. The river otter we reintroduced in 1986 and that is also that species has done very well. As you can see, it's confirmed in 84 counties now. The fisher is one of those examples of a special interest species. It is um, coming into the northeast part of our state from Pennsylvania and um, being extirpated since 1830. And uh, the first modern day confirmed sighting was in 2013. So looking forward to seeing this critter back in our state. The black bear, these are confirmed sightings of black bear in Ohio. And it is listed as endangered and we have at least two confirmations of a female reproducing in our state. So females with cubs, which is, which is very exciting. Unfortunately, our bats have undergone quite a significant decline, um, especially our cave hibernating bats. There is a fungus called white nose syndrome and it's their declines have been about 95% in our state. We are seeing some recovery and we're hopeful that populations will rebound in the future. The Allegheny wood rat is another one of our endangered species. We have about 60 to 70 individuals down in the southern part of the state and we're actively working with other states to, to essentially trade rats to get some greater genetic diversity within our population. Moving on to birds, uh, the bald eagle was delisted in 1979, there were only four nesting pairs. And in our public census in 2020, more than 700 nests were found. So the species is doing very well in our state. The sandhill crane is also doing well. It's still listed as state and threatened, but as you can see, there's quite an increase in the breeding pairs in the, in the past 20 or so years. The trumpeter swan is also doing well and has significantly increased in the past 15 or more years. Moving on to amphibians and reptiles, uh, one of the important species we have in our state for snake diversity is the Massasauga rattlesnake. It's a very small, docile rattlesnake, mostly found on, on public lands. 
in wetland areas. Um, they're pretty limited in their population, but we have a robust population here in Ohio. The Lake Erie water snake was delisted in 2010 federally, but it's still listed um, in Ohio to help protect it. It's only on the Lake Erie Islands and it is doing quite well. The spotted turtle is a threatened species. We are doing quite a few more surveys within our state trying to understand where the populations still are. There's a great partnership up in Northeast Ohio, the spotted group trying to conserve the spotted turtle and make sure that there is habitat available. Moving on to insects, for many years now, uh, the Cincinnati Zoo and the wilds have been reintroducing the American bearing beetle and we have some established populations now. So that's great news. And we have several species that we're, we're keeping track of. You all may have heard about the bee decline. So we've got some statewide surveys trying to better understand what bees we have in our state and their status. The monarch butterfly has also gone undergone quite a significant decline in the past 30 to 40 years. And we understand how important Ohio is for their reproduction. So we're encouraging people to plant milkweed wherever they can. And there are several amphibians and reptiles that we're tracking closely in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service, trying to better understand their status and their need for conservation. Now I'm going to turn it over to John for the aquatic species. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, we're going to switch over to aquatics, and I'm going to go over uh, crayfish, odonates, um, fish, and mussels. And uh, I had a brain fart and for, forgot to put a slide in for hellbender, so I will talk about them too, and then we'll finish up with what, what the future holds. So uh, crayfish. Uh, look a lot like lobsters. I'm sure everybody's probably seen one. We recently had Roger Toma through the uh, Midwest Biodiversity Institute do a statewide survey. He did this for about three years and uh, he recently finished. Um, from that survey, um, the big thing that came out is the Sloan's crayfish. You can see the distribution down by Cincinnati is really solid. Um, there's also a population, obviously, across the border there. They don't stop at Ohio. Um, so they're doing really well. So we actually uh, removed that from listing in 2019. Um, I do want to do shameless plugs along the way for books that we're doing. We're doing these in pa partnership with the Ohio, Bio Ohio Biological Survey, sorry, OBS. And, um, this book isn't out yet. We do have another book that's that's out, but this book that Roger is authoring will be out in uh, early 2022. So it'll be out in time for our uh, big diversity conference that we have at OSU. So uh, a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, on crayfish, we did, this wasn't something that Roger found, but he um, became aware of it. Uh, we do have, um, citizen scientists, um, I'm sure there's some out there in the audience that just have a real desire to um, be in tune with nature and and find cool stuff. And we did have a group find uh, the blue crayfish in Ohio. It is found in West Virginia, but this was the first find in Ohio. And um, yeah, it was just a group of people that are very interested in nature. Um, so pretty cool. It's only found on steep slopes uh, where groundwater sleep, uh, seeps are found. So uh, very, very uh, limited distribution along the Ohio River. Uh, I, I, after we announced this find, I got a slew of people saying that they found a blue crayfish in their farm field in Holmes County. And I had to tell them it was not a blue crayfish. It might have been um, a blue phase of another crayfish, but not not this species. So we're going to be listing that one as endangered because it's just a very limited population. So like I said, the crayfish book will be coming out uh, next year. And just go to the OBS website for information. 
Uh, this one was a, a really cool project we did. Um, it was facilitated by Malisa Spring. Um, she's actually switched over to bees, uh, work, working with Kate. She did a um, statewide survey over, I think it was four years, looking for uh, dragonflies and damselflies. And this is something we hadn't done in quite a while. So it did really trigger a lot of listing changes because a lot of uh, things were uplisted and a lot of things were downlisted. So a lot of changes will be coming to uh, Odinates uh, when we have the uh, new listing come out in 2022. What was neat about this project is basically it was Malisa uh, herding cats. So she had uh, citizen scientists around the whole state uh, providing uh, input on, on finds, mostly through photography. Uh, photography has really improved so much that you can really get some great photos of uh, small critters and be able to ID them. And this was done through iNaturalist, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. Uh, so she basically had regional coordinators that oversaw people working around the state. And it really, really was a very efficient way to uh, do a statewide survey and really engage the public. So um, this will also be a book that will be coming out and will be authored by um, McCormick, McShafery, and Spring and it'll be coming out in 2023. So be looking for this uh, book also through OBS. Uh, we did have um, Brian Zimmerman, he's currently working at OSU uh, in a partnership that we have with um, OSU, the Ohio Biodiversity Conservation Partnership. Uh, we do most of our diversity research through OSU through that partnership. And that survey finished uh, a few years ago, um, but through that, we did a lot of listing changes the last time, but we do have some new listing changes that will be coming up in this next round. Um, the first three are species that were extirpated, which uh, Kate already went through, extirpated means it's found elsewhere, but not in Ohio, uh, but we're bringing them back and uh, it's pretty cool. And that's why they have an asterisk uh, next to them because they are, I'm not calling them experimental populations, but they're um, populations that were uh, reintroduced or repatriated. And the first three are the alligator gar in the Ohio River, uh, black nose shiner, and then the uh, long head darter. So we're working with other states for bringing those species back. Uh, brook trout, uh, I think up in your neck of the woods, you're probably aware of brook trout. Uh, we did find a relic population uh, a while back and preserved some properties to help um, protect the habitat for brook trout and did a lot of work. We actually uh, reintroduced um, brook trout into other locations and we thought we were doing good, uh, but it looks like they're starting to slide. <clears throat> so we have a partnership with um, several groups up there where we're gonna be taking a hard look at brook trout and try to figure out how we can reverse this decline. They're very susceptible to changes in habitat and water quality. They really do need that very cold water and, and certain types of habitat. So um, not sure what's going on there, but we'll, we'll figure it out. But we are gonna uplist that species to endangered because of that. Um, Tippy canoe darter, that's one we've been working at, one with OSU, we've been um, translocating uh, species, uh, this species around. Also, um, we've noticed an interesting um, increase in certain species, and I, I, I say it's all because of the Clean Water Act, uh, which is celebrating its 50-year anniversary. Really did a great job in improving water quality, and we've seen species like the bluegrass tippy canoe uh, just expand their range from uh, these little, I guess you would call them, uh, I'm trying to think, like Noah's Ark, just little refugia that they had, like Big Darby Creek, Little Darby, other locations that were able to hold these species. Well, they've expanded on their own, and then we're also helping them. And then the blue blue catfish, uh, we're delisting that. That's actually, uh, we're stocking that species, and it's actually uh, become a very popular sport fish. So it's it's doing so well that 
you can actually go out and fish for them. This book has already been published uh, and it's available through OBS through their website and it was uh, authored by uh, Dan Rice and uh, Brian Zimmerman. Mussels, is a, this is a, an interesting one, similar to bats, they're, they're not doing real good and they, it's because they twofold, uh, they're really uh, tied to water quality, good water quality. And also they require a intermediate host to finish their life cycle, which is mostly fish. So um, as part of the life cycle that Glaukitty or, or baby mussels will attach to fish, um, I think it was probably part of their distribution um, philosophy, which is to attach to a fish which would swim elsewhere and then they release and then become uh, juvenile mussels. So probably a distribution mechanism. But um, we have not done a statewide survey on mussels. Mussel surveys, are, they're really expensive to do. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to get a better idea of how uh, mussels are doing. So we do really uh, rely on expert input for mussels, which is how we came up with these listing changes. Uh, I'm going to finish up with a couple of mussel um, stories. Uh, Fish, Fish Creek up in Williams County, that's the northern, northwest uh, portion of the state. Uh, we did a lot of uh, land preservation through the TNC uh, because of the white cat's paw. It's a federally endangered mussel, uh, but we did a mussel blitz over two days with uh, a lot of top-notch malacologists. Uh, one of them being there, the the lady on the on the gravel bar there kneeling in the blue shirt. That's uh, Megan Michael with ODOT. She's probably one of the top malacologists in the state, um, and she helped us out. We did not find the white cat's paw, but we did find uh, a lot of live mussels over four, close to 1,400, uh, 21 species, which is just uh, spectacular. Uh, really high diversity uh, for mussels. We did find three federally listed species and six species of concern. So this is quite the hidden gem <clears throat> up in Northwest Ohio. So we'll hopefully do more muscle blitzes. It's a really good way to, to get an idea of what's going on. And then I'm gonna finish with a project we did on the Wahonding River in Coshocton County, removed the six mile dam. Uh, this was to benefit, um, well, it was, it was a safety concern. This dam was probably gonna fail. Uh, but it was really our our main reason for doing it was for muscle restoration. And as they were taking down the dam and the dam pool lowered, the idea is to relocate mussels that are stranded. As part of this effort, uh, over 1,200 mussels were relocated, 24 species, so even better than Fish Creek for diversity. And amazingly, we found <clears throat> lots and lots of federally endangered mussels mainly uh, the sheep nose and rabbit's foot. So uh, really cool. I love dam removals, a uh, big piece of equipment and uh, a lot of diesel fuel can get a, a lot of restoration done. I, I, like I said, I didn't put a slide in for hellbenders. I didn't, I don't know what I was thinking. It's a huge effort we have with uh, many partners to, uh, to reverse the decline of this uh, largest amphibian in Ohio. Um, truly aquatic, it spends all its life cycle in the, um, in the water. Um, so we've been working with Toledo Zoo, Columbus Zoo, uh, Greg Lips at OSU, and many partners on habitat protection. And then the zoos are actually raising uh, hellbenders for release. We've released over a thousand three-year-old uh, hellbenders in southwest, southeast Ohio, which is their stronghold. So really cool effort that we'll keep, keep going on. So what we can do, uh, Ohio is 95% uh, private land, uh, only 5% of it is, is publicly owned. So uh, it's up to you folks out there to help. Uh, one of the big initiatives is uh, pollinator habitat, uh, trying to get uh, you know, milkweed and other uh, pollinator plants uh, out there on the landscape uh, to help monarchs and many other uh, bees and butterflies and moths and everything else that survives on, on these plants. Um, to give you my story, uh, we have a very small pollinator patch in our yard. We live in a neighborhood in Columbus. Um, 
but amazingly, the monarchs are able to find this small patch. And this year, uh, what we do is when we find a, a monarch caterpillar, we take it and put it in a mesh cage with milkweed to help increase its survival. And that's kind of cool to watch the watch them transform into butterflies. And we released over 20 uh, monarchs this year, which is amazing for a very small patch, which is uh, smaller than the size of my office. So uh, even you can you can make a difference in your in your yard. We'll continue uh, monitoring and research, uh, mostly through OSU and other uh, partners. Uh, butterflies, like Kate said, bats are not doing so well, and bees, so working on those. I do really want to work on mussels and really figure out how to get more mussel surveys done. So uh, much more is going to happen in the future. Uh, you can show your support. Uh, you can buy a hunting and fishing license, which will go towards uh, habitat protection. We also have our legacy stamp, which comes out every year. Uh, Kate, what's the next one coming up? Bald Eagles, the next one. So what we do is we have uh, people out there take pictures of the species. So a bald eagle will be this year. Take a picture, you send it to us, and it goes and gets judged. And um, you could be on the cover of the uh, the stamp. So uh, pretty cool effort we have. And this go all goes towards diversity. Uh, you can have a, uh, a, a, a license plate, uh, the cardinal plate, which all goes towards diversity. Kate and I both have this license plate. It supports uh, the Division of Wildlife's diversity program. There's also a tax check off. So at tax time, you can also do that. The big one that's coming up <clears throat> and uh, if you have more questions about it, Kate's been really uh, engaged in this one, and it's the Recovery America's Wildlife Act, and it's currently uh, going through federal legislation. It's it's uh, trying to become a bill, uh, and this would uh, 10x the num the amount of money with that we have for diversity. So it would be taking our garden hose of diversity funding and make it a fire hose. Uh, really, really bump up the ability we have to do great things for diversity. So this is currently moving through the legislature, looking very promising, uh, bipartisan support, which is amazing in this day and age that uh, working across the aisle on a piece of legislation. So um, if you have any questions, Kate can uh, chime in, but it's, Kate, it's looking good. Hi. Yeah, it's looking good so far. So very, very exciting. Uh, and we couldn't do this without partnerships. Uh, so we do work with a lot of people. We do have two big conferences a year. Well, we, our big one is the diversity conference and that's in March and that's at OSU. Uh, and that one draws about a thousand people. It's, uh, it's pretty good. And we talk about everything diversity. Uh, we also have a smaller group that gets together and you can see this is uh, everybody sitting on the glacial grooves uh, on the islands. And uh, we get together once a year to talk with our, our, our close partners on, on projects we can do, uh, funding and all kinds of cool stuff. So we have had to, we had to cancel last year's because of COVID. Uh, hopefully we'll be back in uh, next year. So that's all I have. Here's our contact information for Kate and I. And you can also go and see our um, listing information that we've been talking about at that um, link at the bottom. So I will bring Kate back into the page and we will uh, take questions. Thank you so much, guys. That was um, really fascinating. If any of you um, watching have questions, that would be a good time. You can put them in the chat box. Uh, I do have a question for both of you, I guess. Um, if I was looking to join one of these citizen science groups, um, are there ones you would recommend or places I should look to start? Yeah, I don't know, Kate, do you? There, there's ahead, there's Kate. a bunch, it just depends on your interest. So if you're into birds, if you could submit your sightings via eBird, and we use that information to better understand distribution across the state. Um, Ohio Lepidopterist, if you're interested in butterflies, they hold an annual workshop to get trained on identifying butterflies. So it really depends on your interest. If you're 
interested in something, there's there's a place for you in, in Ohio's wildlife diversity. Yeah, and I mentioned iNaturalist. Uh, that's a great place to record your sightings. Um, so it would be a, a good photograph uh, with a good location, and then that would get vetted through the experts out there. And uh, if it's a good record, it would be uh, we would use it uh, as part of our um, bumping up our distribution information. Awesome. Um, Kate, you had mentioned uh, the white nose syndrome in bats. There's something I could do as a citizen to maybe help that, whether it's installing bat boxes or trying to create some kind of habitat. Yeah, absolutely. Bat boxes are a great idea. Um, you could also help collect information. You could monitor one of those bat boxes and report to the division. We have a roost monitoring um, survey that anyone can do. We've got protocols on our website. Um, if you're more interested and have some additional time to spend, we're always looking for volunteers to run the acoustic surveys. And essentially, we have an acoustic monitor, monitor on top of a vehicle, and you drive a particular route, and then we can better understand what species of bats are using that area. So the more we know about bats, the better we can do to reduce the other threats outside of white nose, you know, make sure that they have habitat both in the summer and the winter, um, do our best to understand their life history. And um, hopefully when they have figured out a way to recover from white nose, which it seems like many of them, many of the species are, then all those other threats will be reduced and they can come back into our state. Awesome. Um, John, what is the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly? So basically it's the wing position. Um, the dragonfly, if you see it, it will have its wings, it'll go straight out, whereas the damselfly is kind of like that. Uh, they're very similar. Um, it's a taxonomy thing, which I am not a taxonomist, but uh, that's the basic, how you can tell the difference. <laughs> Um, a question from Christina. I have some butterfly weed and butterfly bushes in my front yard in Cleveland Eastern suburbs. She says she sees tons of monarchs in her yard, but have never seen a chrysalis. I'm wondering if my butterfly weed is not the preferred variety or host plant. Um, how do I know if I have the right type of milkweed or where I can get some? So sometimes uh, your soil and water conservation district can help with milkweed. Um, you can also go to the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative. That's a partnership that we're involved in and um, taking milkweed that's collected from Ohio citizens and processing that into seed that can be planted. Um, and chrysalises are just incredibly hard to find. But what's easier to find on your milkweed is something eating your milkweed. So if you notice that the leaves um, have damage to them, then you may have monarch caterpillars that are eating your milkweed. But I think I've only found one chrysalis where I've found many, many caterpillars. And I don't know, John, you've had yeah. the same experience. My personal experience is if you don't get that caterpillar in, like I said, we have a mesh cage, we put them in with milkweed. The predation on insects is just insane. Um, so a very, very low survival rate. So if you see a caterpillar one day, it might not be there the next day and it might have been uh, eaten. So that's why we kind of help them by never found a chrysalis. Uh, but I see them all the time in my cage because they're not, they're very, they're contained. They can't go anywhere. And it's cool to watch them go up and then they kind of do a J hook and then they'll, it's just an amazing uh, metamorphosis to watch in the mesh cage. And you can buy them, the mesh cage, in uh, lots of different places. And, uh, it's just cool to watch. I'm like a little kid with <laughs> so yeah, keep planting that milkweed. Yeah, they're they're munching on it, but it's hard to find the chrysalises and the caterpillars. All right, well I think that about does it. Um, thank you so much, both of you. Again, John and Kate from ODNR's Division of Wildlife. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Um, if anyone watching, if you have any follow up questions, you come up come up with, um, you can reach out to me as well. Uh, my name is Eric Pretzlov. I'm an AmeriCorps member with CRWP, um, and my information is on the flyer that led you here. Um, so I think that's it. Thank you both so much, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Good talking to you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. See ya.